Well, welcome everyone to uh, class number three. Now, I, I pulled a trick on you all. I uh, flip-flopped these two classes. Uh, so if you thought you were gonna hear about Darwin and Genesis, that's gonna occur on July 11th. Because I thought we had kind of a nice natural continuum of the first two classes leading into this topic of the spiritual life. So I thought that would be uh, more appropriate. Plus, it's best to talk about evolution you know, after the holiday, not before. <laughs> As a reminder, no class next Tuesday. So we're taking July 4th off, uh, enjoy the holiday, uh, and then we'll resume the following Tuesday. And of course, my, my weekly plug for RCIA this fall. So if you know anyone uh, or you yourself are thinking about the Catholic Church uh, as something you'd like to explore, uh, the, the program starts in September, the first Sunday after Labor Day, September 11th at 11.15. So our, our topic tonight is grace and the spiritual life. Now, I'm going to start what feels like a long way away from the topic. Uh, you might thought I was going to launch into the infant of Prague or the sacred heart of Jesus or something uh, like that devotional. And I'm really going to start where I think our culture is today. Uh, but up to this point, we've been highly theological. This class will uh, turn more practical, and you'll see that as we go. Uh, but this is the, we're now going to touch ground a bit more about what grace is and what's its significance to us in our daily lives. It's the so what question. Why do I care about this? These are the questions people who are uh, searching today, uh, not just Catholics, have. What difference does grace make in my life, truly, concretely? Uh, and what does it mean to have a graced experience? Or we hear that sometimes in homilies about uh, our experience of faith. Uh, and we'll spend some time talking about that. We start with a predicament. You know, we always have to start with some kind of friction to get the juices flowing. But what is the predicament that the spiritual life presents us? The predicament is we clearly, as Christians, affirm the presence and action of God in our lives in various beautiful ways. But if God's action and grace in our lives is uh, real, it should be accessible to us like any other kind of human experience. Uh, the friendship you might have with people, the love you have for family and friends, acquaintances at work, you experience them daily. Yet God, as we know, is infinite and transcendent. He's not an item in our world like other things are items in our world for us to experience. He's not just some factor uh, in a list of things that we claim to experience every day, every week. If God is perfect, perfect love, perfect truth, perfect life, how do we have access to that in our human experience, which is finite? In short, if God isn't easily accessible in our experience, or perhaps not at all, how do we say we're living a spiritual life, we have a graced uh, presence of God in our life? And how deep in that relationship with God, if we have this problem of an infinite God who seems far away at times, uh, and our own finite existence? And yet we also affirm that God is more intimate to created things than they even are to themselves as their cause. He even created cell phones that don't turn off. <laughs> so you see, that's the predicament, that we have this beautiful God, and how is he even accessible? And these are maybe not questions that are top of mind for you, but they're top of mind for our culture. And it's important we start where our culture is so that we can then make <coughs> the connections that we need to. So this predicament that I'm talking about, for my money, is the issue in our culture today. Namely, 
that our social order, our political order is characterized these days in the West, in this country, it's permeated, as I call it, by a functional agnosticism or a functional atheism. Questions of God are subject to personal tastes, opinions, and they can't be resolved, so there's no sense in resolving them. And then the public space over the last 50 to 60 years in this country and longer has continually crowded out religious expressions or any sense of God as being a principle of how we would order our lives as people, as a society, or have any impact on our civil laws. So Pope Francis in his first encyclical, and this one didn't get much notice because he was actually completing an encyclical that Benedict XVI had started. And you can see the influence of Benedict actually in the topic and the characterization of the struggle today. I'll read this quote to you. Quote, Our culture has lost its sense of God's tangible presence and activity in our world. We think that God is to be found in the beyond on another level of reality, far removed from our everyday relationships. But if this were the case, if God could not act in the world, his love would not be truly powerful, truly real, and thus not even true, a love capable of delivering the bliss that it promises. It would make no difference at all whether we believed in him or not. Christians, on the contrary, profess that their faith in God's tangible and powerful love, which really does act in history and determines its final destiny, a love that can be encountered, a love fully revealed in Christ's passion, death, and resurrection. So Pope Francis and, in part, Pope Benedict are calling out the fact that our culture today has lost this sense of God. And this, we are at a crisis point, if, if you read through the rest of this encyclical, and other works of Pope Benedict XVI. And if you take a step back, it, it would seem that the church encounters a major crisis about every 500 years. So Bishop Sheen and G.K. Chesterton were always fond of saying that uh, in the first 500 years, we had the Christological controversies, the Council of Nicaea, all the way through the Council of Chalcedon in 451 A.D. Who is Jesus? So a controversy over who is Christ. Fast forward the tape of history to the year 1000. We had a crisis over the Great Schism between East and West. Christ's head. Fast forward that tape 500 more years to the 1500s. We just spent a class on another crisis, the crisis of the church. Christ's body. So what's the crisis now? It's, it's really now a crisis over who is God? Is God? And what does it mean to be a human? So we seem to have this cyclical nature of our crises that strike at the root of society and our sense of ourselves and as a people. And this was very much top of mind for Pope Benedict XVI as the issue for society today. It's forgetfulness of God and the implications for the human person. If we continue, John Cyril, some of you may have heard of, uh, perhaps not a household name, uh, but he is a very famous Oxford professor and he had a very good an interesting quotation uh, in a magazine uh, called Free Inquiry. And this is the dialogue that took place between the interviewer and John Cyril. So the interviewer asked, we're a secular humanist magazine, the Free Inquiry magazine, which means that we like to think of ourselves as children of the Enlightenment. So we must ask you, John, do you personally believe in God? John Cyril, I don't. Actually, the best remark about this was by Bertrand Russell at a dinner I attended when I was an undergraduate. Russell was 85 years old. We were all a bunch of kids, and we thought he's not going to live much longer, and he's a famous atheist, so let's really put it to him. So we asked him, what would happen if you were wrong about the existence of God? What would you say to him? That is, suppose you died and you went to heaven, and there you were in front of him. What would you say? 
Russell didn't hesitate for a second. He said, I would say, you didn't give us enough evidence. And I think that's my attitude. On the available evidence we have about how the world works, we have to say that we're alone and that there is no God. We don't have a cosmic friend. We're on our own. I might be wrong about that, but on the available evidence, that's the situation we're in. So I guess that makes me a kind of agnostic. And you have no belief in the supernatural? Cyril responded, none. But you see there's something else that is in a way more important in this issue of the supernatural. Intellectuals in our culture have become so secularized, there's a sense in which the existence of the supernatural wouldn't matter in a way that it mattered 100 years ago. Suppose we discovered that we're wrong, that there really is this divine force in the universe. Well, then most intellectuals would say, okay, that's a fact of physics like any other. Instead of just four forces in the universe, we have a fifth force. In this sense, our attitude about the existence of God wouldn't be as important because the world has already become demystified for us. Essentially, our worldview would remain even if we discovered that we had been wrong, that God did not exist. So the Pope and... I, thank you, that, that God did exist. So the Pope and, from another perspective, John Cyril, uh, are identifying the same kind of, of rampant agnosticism, atheism, in the culture. And apart from Cyril just committing a basic freshman philosophy error, what's called a category mistake, characterizing God as another materialistic mechanistic cause, which is what a scientistic uh, philosophy can only admit, uh, it's, it's an error to think of God as just another factor in the universe versus being the ground of anything that exists. We spent some time on this last year about scientism and how it shrivels human experience and human reason to this very quantified materialistic view. Another legacy of the Enlightenment is reason is set, it sets itself up as the primary arbiter of what God means and what he can be in our experience. So from John Caputo, a, another philosopher, reason does not take what is out there on face value and then adjust to it. On the contrary, by reason we mean the authority to determine what is out there in the first place and to set the standards to which things measure up. That is what the age of reason, the enlightenment, means. It, it ha all has to do with who has the authority and the power, faith or reason. God, the subject matter of theology par excellence, has come under the principles of reason, which are the jurisdiction of philosophy, rather, rather than reason coming under God, the subject matter of theology. God has to stand in line like everyone else. What's fair is fair. You see how this is in the air today, uh, and it's the context for how we conduct our spiritual life. Uh, and that's why I'm, I'm starting here. Uh, one last tidbit, uh, another gift from the Enlightenment, uh, is this emphasis then to protect religious experience. A man named Friedrich Schielmacher said, well, in order to protect religious experience from the assaults of science and rationalistic philosophy, religious experience isn't rationally based. It's subjectively based. It's based upon my subjective experience of feeling God's uh, infinitude, my dependency, uh, and he developed uh, several treatises along these lines. You could see what he was trying to do is protect religion, spiritual experience from the mind. And so uh, that then launched a fundamental error that my experience of God uh, creates a kind of equality between me and God. God can be experienced like any other thing in the universe. And it, it, it results in a kind of skewing, as we'll see, of the spiritual life. Quoting someone named Han, Hans Urs von Balthasar, who was a priest who John Paul II, toward the end of his life, made a cardinal, 
a, a theologian, though he said he was not a theologian, even though he wrote many books of theology, and a Jesuit, uh, was highly influential on uh, Cardinal Ratzinger, uh, Pope Benedict XVI, and John Paul in terms of their intellectual formation. And I'd just like to read a few quotations from him. God is not just one being among others encountered in this world and perceived by human senses and spiritual insight in an experience accumulated in the course of a lifetime. Hence, it is to be expected that one cannot experience God as one does a mundane thing or even a fellow human being. God is essentially our origin, from which we are sent forth not by a natural growth like a branch sprouting from a stem, but in sovereign freedom that sends us forth in our creaturely independence and freedom. If we view God and man only as the opposites, creator and creatures, this feeling is comparable to the groping of a blind person who, beyond this space crammed with finite objects, fumbles around in infinity trying to find something to touch with his spiritual hand. So you see how he's, he's responding to what John Cyril was, was presenting, that if you're trying to find God as just another item in your experience and you're groping to find that, you will not find God that way. And uh, what, what von Balthasar is, will develop in this work and others is a kind of theology based upon a spiritual experience of, of God's presence and absence. And we'll, we'll dive into that in a moment. But you see what we're left with from a secular point of view. Because uh, you might be asking yourself, Charles, why are you starting this way? I thought we were going to talk about grace and the spiritual life. Well, the reason is that this is the culture we're living in now. And if we don't know where it's coming from, uh, we won't be able to evangelize that culture as well as lead our spiritual lives in that culture. So that's why I'm starting this way. And, and if you read contemporary authors, they're not so contemporary anymore, uh, someone like a Jean-Paul Sartre, even though we would reject his existentialist philosophy in general, when he writes about the anguish of the person who is left with nothing but their own freedom by which they can then construct what, construct what it means to be human, anguish sets in because we have these aspirations for what's beautiful, what's infinitely true and loving, and we can't get there. This is the anguish that uh, French existentialism spends so much time talking about. So. The reason why you read people you may disagree with is because they still have talent to describe life without God really well. And if you read the French literature of the time uh, and later, people like Albert Camus or people like Thomas Mann, they are dramatizing what the human project is left with when God doesn't exist. And then, of course, we have the the uh, workers' paradises uh, that wanted to replace God uh, in societies in the 20th century, which turned Eastern Europe into one large concentration camp. And uh, so we have all these uh, utopians uh, that uh, without God, uh, you're not just left with a neutral society. It's never just, well, just benign relativism. And we talked about this last year, that when God vacates the scene, you're not left with a glass of tap water. You're left with camps. You're left with speech codes. You're left with uh, atheism. You're left with schools being closed because they were uh, started by Catholics or Christians, and so on. And we see that in, this, in our country. If you would like to offer adoption services, uh, what are your views on same-sex marriage and giving uh, children up for adoption to those couples? If you're Catholic Charities, it means you're no longer free to provide adoption services in this country. So it's coming our way. And so this is why I'm starting where I'm starting, uh, because this is no longer about simply uh, our latest novena that we want to talk about. And I'm not in any way uh, shortchanging novenas. They're important. I'm talking about the context by which we're leading our spiritual lives today. So continuing, one last uh, point on this. Uh, this is from an article written in a magazine, a theological journal, Nova et Vetera, 
by a, a German theologian, Reinhold Hutter, who I actually had an opportunity to have dinner with uh, about a year ago. And uh, he was teaching at the seminary here in Mundelein uh, for about a year as part of a, 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 a chair, an endowed chair. And he was able to spend some time uh, uh, with uh, people like myself, uh, which was a great opportunity for me to meet him. And he also gave some great talks on conscience and Cardinal Newman. Uh, but he grew up in Germany, kind of ground zero for relativism and atheism, and was sharing interesting experiences there in academia in Germany. You think it's bad here? <laughs> so, uh, but he wrote an interesting article on what I call, uh, and what he called, uh, the sovereign self, which is the icon today. If the icon of medieval times was the Madonna with child, the icon today is a selfie on my cell phone. That is the dominant image that characterizes our society. So let me read a few passages to you. Quote, the, thus the modern subject vacillates between two competing self-images. On the one side, we find the Gnostic angelism of the disembodied sovereign self that may submit to its will an absolutely malleable and fluid exteriority. By that he means the body. I'll stop there, and you might be saying, what the heck is he talking about? Uh, Bruce Jenner is what he's talking about. If, if, I can, if my sexuality, based upon my body and biology, is provisional and subject to my higher choice, my true spiritual self, then I can uh, advance that identity, and now we have laws protecting that. That's what he's talking about. This Gnostic angelism, that my true self is a spiritual self that is abstract from sexuality and from any other physical characteristics I might have, including my gender. And on the other side, we find the materialistic animalism of a super primate. That is the accidental product of the intricate interplay between random genetic mutation and specific ecological niche preferment. I won't even try to explain what he means by that. Uh, but it's basically the materialism of Darwin, which we'll cover a bit in next class. The extremes touch each other insofar as transhumanism, which is actually a real movement, by the way, an outgrowth of the fantasies of the sovereign self, and posthumanism, the reductive understanding of the human being as super primate, coincide in their de facto erasure of the embodied rational being, the animal rational. As always, so also in our contemporary context, deeply shaped by the utopian pretenses of transhumanism and posthumanism, sovereignty, the sovereignty of the self, has two aspects, the sovereign agent and the objects upon which sovereignty is exercised. The interminable struggle in late modern technologically advanced, economically consumer capitalist, and politically liberal societies of the Western Hemisphere is to avoid at all costs being subjected to, and thereby objectified by the sovereignty of others and simultaneously to maximize one's possibilities of exercising subjective sovereignty. In our robustly secular and deeply skeptical Western societies, subjective sovereignties is the one transcendence the modern subject remains certain of since it is self-produced. This particular form of transcendence is a decidedly imminent transcendence for its outer horizon is death. Death defies all strategies of maintaining or increasing subjective sovereignty, albeit with one significant exception, the unique strategy of folding death into the last act of one's own subjective sovereignty by sovereignly determining the terminus of oneself and the subsequent annihilation of one's body. It is this deeply ironic yet equally deeply consistent consequence that, both, that betrays the profound pretension and falsehood of the self-image of subjective sovereignty. That's a mouthful, uh, but today in Europe, you have active euthanasia laws that don't require the consent of the patient, only the consent of their guardian. So this is one example of subjective sovereignty that isn't necessarily chosen by the person, but perhaps they had signed a living will, perhaps they'd given direction, whatever it might be, uh, this is happening and, and spreading as, as you can tell, 
as I was reading this. I would also mention to you this notion of transhumanism might be a new term for some of you, uh, but it's actually uh, there are transhumanist movements uh, throughout the West. And I was looking at First Things online. First Things is a magazine uh, that some of you may have heard of, and they publish things online. And I'll read to you an article by Jessica Keating briefly, one paragraph, on transhumanism. Transhumanism holds that with the aid of technology, human beings can and should evolve beyond our current physical and mental limitations. Transhumanists point to the history of human manipulation of the environment, of medicine, and, and bodily ornamentation to argue that transhumanism is merely one step on the road of progress. Absent a persuasive and compelling vision of human nature and human dignity, transhumanism exerts enormous pressure on the social imagination. In less than a decade, scientists have perfected human cloning and gene editing. So this can go on uh, and on, and there are other things that uh, the transhumanists are after. But I mention this to you as this is what is at stake uh, in our culture as we think of our spiritual life. So just to wrap this topic up, what this is is a rejection of God's sovereignty whether it's in its transhumanism form of I am a true angel and whatever I choose to do with my body is my choice because my body is just an appendage. Or posthumanism where I am a super primate, the result of a Darwinistic force uh, that I come from matter. And so both involve a rejection of God's sovereignty the notion that creation is revelatory of God's design for us uh, and that we are called to a spiritual life in the first place. So this long march of enlightenment that I was talking about both now and last year, we arrive at the self as, as the primary starting point for all considerations. And as a result, the self cut off from the traditional aids and comforts of Christianity and other things is left with anguish. And so that's the malaise that afflicts the West today, is that the sovereignty of God is no longer seen as the basis for human rights or the dignity of the human person. And the spiritual life isn't even a question that should come up in the first place. That's why it was important to start here. So how get out of this? How get out of the predicament? Because this is the predicament that we're in. It's the air we breathe. I have an office downtown in Chicago in the loop, and all you have to do is walk along those streets. If you doubt what I've just spent a little time on, uh, I don't think anyone does, but if you did, uh, just walk the streets of any major city uh, in the world, except maybe those in uh, Saudi Arabia and Iran and Iraq. So how get out? Well, let's look at the biblical perspective of this. Because this emphasis on me, my experience, uh, even in homilies you will hear this notion of human experience as normative for my spiritual life, a conversion experience, uh, a forgiveness experience. And there's a sense, of course, in which that is absolutely correct. But let's look more closely at how the Bible views experience, human experience, and God. Think of the first story of the testing of Abraham and his son Isaac, where God asks him to uh, sacrifice his son. It's, a, it's going to be a type for what happens in the New Testament when God, as Father, sacrifices his son, Jesus Christ. And then the angel stops him from sacrificing Isaac. So there was a testing of Abraham, and God was pleased that Abraham faithfully was going to follow God's instructions, even if it meant uh, killing his son Isaac. Or think of Paul's conversion story uh, in Acts of the Apostles. We don't really hear about Paul's subjective conversion experience, do we? We just hear that he converted, that <laughs> Paul on the road to Damascus <coughs> Here's the Lord saying, why are you persecuting me? It was an interesting question that Paul was asked. 
Paul was killing Christians, and, and yet Jesus said to him, why are you persecuting me? Well, Paul was attacking the body of Christ, so the head complained. If someone kicks you in the shins, your head complains. Paul was attacking the body of Christ. So Paul converted after that experience of meeting Jesus. But there was no discussion of Paul's inner life or conversion experience. He merely converted. And if we read a passage from Balthazar on his uh, chapter on experience God, quote, it is not man who is to experience God. Rather, God wants to experience and to ascertain experimentally by means of testing whether the commissioned person is walking the path indicated by God. We saw that testing in the story of Abraham and Isaac. Whereas the Bible nowhere speaks of an experience of God on man's part, the theme of God's experience of man by means of testing appears throughout the whole of salvation history. And then interesting emphasis we often hear homilies that, that invert that, that my experience of God and grace is more important than maybe church teaching because it's mine, it's my experience. The experience of gay couples coming forth, presenting themselves for communion will say to the pastor, but we have an experience of love in our relationship. How can you deny that? You see where I'm... I'm heading with this. If your human experience is absolutely normative for you in your spiritual life, you're not biblically based. That experience is subject to a higher critique, this testing of God. Let me give you a few other examples. Uh, so from Paul's letter to the Romans, uh, chapter 5. He's talking about uh, his faith and peace that he experiences in our Lord Jesus Christ through whom he has gained access to the grace and glory in which he stands. But he continues in verse 3, Not only that, but we even boast of our afflictions, knowing that afflictions produce endurance, and endurance, proven character, and proven character, hope, and hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. So we have an example here of precisely his afflictions and the, the roadblocks that were always thrown in front of Paul produce this hope and confidence and joy. So another example would be the letter of James, chapter 1. Consider it all joy, my brothers, when you encounter various trials. For you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. So this, this theme of God testing us to produce perseverance, which produces the virtues of faith, hope, and love, is the major theme of, our, of the spiritual life we find in the New Testament. Continuing uh, from an earlier work that I cited to you by Father Oaks, A Theology of Grace, Quote, the divine testing will be something every Christian experiences who chooses to respond to God's call, but it's not the experience that counts, only the testing. St. Ignatius of Loyola says in his spiritual exercises that everyone must keep in mind that in all that concerns the spiritual life, his progress will be in proportion to his surrender of self-love and of his own will and interests. That is the key to the experience of grace. Any felt sense of God's presence in grace that is not grounded in the fertile soil of self-denial will not be grace, but mere self-deception. See how that's just 180 degrees opposed to our culture of self? That I validate what is grace for me. I validate what is true, good, and beautiful for me. And for you to impose something from the Bible or any other source is ideological, is, is power run amok. You see the clash here of the, the biblical understanding of the spiritual life and the self in that and our modern contemporary idea of the self that we spent a little time on. This is not to say experiences 
irrelevant. Of course it's not. As I mentioned here, it's not about suppressing the experience of God. It's about discerning what is God calling me in that experience to do, to believe. And we could cite many examples of this uh, in our culture, in our society, even in our church. Couples who are Catholic, let's say, uh, who are unable to have children, but believe the church is calling them to have a, a full family, and they explore uh, artificial insemination and in vitro fertilization technologies, which run counter to the church's teaching on love and sexuality but they want their children. And so the fact that there are frozen, embryo, frozen embryos that are kind of a collateral damage of that, that, we can deal with that because I want what I want. But there are many examples I could, I could present uh, that illustrate this sovereign self clashing with the spiritual life that the Bible and the church present. There are other examples that, to point to about the prophets of the Old Testament. It, the prophets are always kind of reluctant <laughs> and unwilling participants initially. Uh, you can think of Jonah. <laughs> you could think of many examples, but I'll pick two, Ezekiel and Jeremiah. So Ezekiel, chapters 2 and 3, Chapter 2, the voice said to me, Son of man, stand up. So God is saying to Ezekiel, stand up. I wish to speak to you. As he spoke to me, the Spirit entered into me and set me on my feet. And I heard the one who was speaking say to me, Son of man, I am sending you to the Israelites, a nation of rebels who have rebelled against me. They and their ancestors have been in revolt against me to this very day. Their children are bold of face and stubborn of heart. To them I am sending you, and you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord God. And whether they hear or resist, they are a rebellious house. They shall know that a prophet has been among them. But as for you, son of man, do not fear them or their words. Do not fear, even though there are briars or thorns and you sit among scorpions. Do not be afraid of their words or be terrified by their looks, for they are a rebellious house. You must speak my words to them, whether they hear or resist. But you, son of man, hear me when I speak to you, and do not rebel like them. Open your mouth and eat what I'm giving you. It was then that I saw a hand stretched out to me, and it was a written scroll. He unrolled it before me. It was covered with writing front and back. Right, written on it was lamentation, wailing, and woe. And then continuing in chapter 3, But the house of Israel will refuse to listen to you, since they refuse to listen to me. For the whole house of Israel is stubborn of brow and hard of heart. Look, I make your face as hard as theirs, and your brow as stubborn as theirs. Like a diamond harder than flint, I make your brow. Do not be afraid of them or terrified by their looks, for they are rebellious. So Ezekiel uh, was not thrilled with this commission and uh, tried to get out of it. And then we have probably the most famous uh, example in Jeremiah chapter 20. And uh, this one is one of my favorites. And Jeremiah, after a career of being a, a largely unsuccessful prophet, he was dropped on a well, uh, he was made fun of, not listened to, uh, on and on, he finally writes in chapter 20, You seduced me, Lord, and I let myself be seduced. You were too strong for me, and you prevailed. All day long I am an object of laughter. Everyone mocks me. Whenever I speak, I must cry out. Violence and outrage I proclaim. The word of the Lord has brought me reproach and derision all day long. I say I will not mention him. I will no longer speak in his name. But then it is as if fire is burning in my heart, imprisoned in my bones. I grow weary holding back. I cannot hold it in. So you see this conflict in Jeremiah as well of this commission that is, uh, as a prophet, has gotten him in all kinds of trouble. And God is testing him, though. And he ultimately sees it, and he knows he's being tested, and he knows he's been seduced, 
and he even says, I can't resist this, and in fact, I can't keep it in. So we see this divine testing continually through the Old Testament and the prophets, and of course, uh, in the New Testament, Jesus is characterized by his obedience to the Father even unto death. So our modern preoccupation with the self and our New Age spiritualities that uh, worship the self clash with the biblical notion of the spiritual life, the call of the prophets. Uh, and our, we shouldn't throw that baby out with the bathwater as much as we should try to discern in our human experience what God is calling me to do based upon what he has revealed. But as Balthazar continues in this article on Experience God, quote, the law of renunciation can become very difficult for the individual in times when genuine ecclesial life finds feeble expression, and numerous sects offer the enticement of immediate experiences. What he's referring there to is, quite simply, oftentimes Catholic masses are, are done badly and turn people off and turn people away. We have priests who, uh, unfortunately, uh, often say mass uh, as if they're in a hurry to be somewhere else, or homilies that are not inspiring, or music that is terrible, or architecture that resembles a pizza hut. And, and so uh, this is what he means by uh, when genuine ecclesial experiences find feeble expression, meaning they're not inspiring. And so... He says the temptation to go to another religion, uh, it could be an evangelical church that has great music and great preaching and large crowds of enthusiastic people. That's the enticement that he's referring to. But no one who experiences this difficulty should think that the mystic, with his apparently immediate experiences of divine things, has an easier life. For every true mysticism, however rich it may be in visions and other experiences of God, is subject at least as strictly to the law of the cross, that is, of non-experience, as is the existence of someone apparently forgotten in the desert of secular life. Perhaps the mystic has to pass through dry periods that are even more severe. Where this is not the case, where we are offered acquirable techniques to attain mysticism without bitterness, and the humiliations of the cross. We can be certain that it is not authentically Christian and has no Christian significance. What comes to mind for me here are the Sunday morning Gospels of Prosperity shows. Not to pick on him, because he's got a great dental plan, but Joel Olstein. Um, you know, the, the, this Gospel of Prosperity, the Gospel is about you being your best self, living your best life, getting that next job, getting that home in the suburbs. That's the gospel of prosperity that has captivated many uh, preachers. And again, there's just been a little sleight of hand move that what the gospel is about is validating all the things you want in life and helping you get there. And we even, sadly, will hear homilies from time to time from Catholic priests that what the faith is about is here and now uh, giving you things uh, or allowing you answers to questions that you need to live. Now, there's a sense in which that's true. But as we all know, there are human experiences where there is no answer to be found in this life. And yet we are still being tested to walk forward in God's path. So this is the point that, that Balthazar is after. To take this a step further... Mother Teresa, and it's in your bibliography, uh, but Mother Teresa wrote a, a work, and it's really a collection of her writings, uh, but it's in a work called Come Be My Light, and it's, it's published by Image in 2007, uh, approximately 10 years after she passed away. I, I had the wonderful opportunity of meeting Mother Teresa a few times in the uh, late 70s and early 80s. Um, and she's maybe four foot ten, four foot eleven, but radi radiated a, an incredible uh, presence and power of God. 
Uh, and perhaps, I think everyone knows who she was, but she was a, a, a saint, is a saint, who uh, spent her life in India and other poor places uh, helping the poorest of the poor in all of their corporal needs, corporal works of mercy, whether it's comforting a person who's about to die on the sidewalk, giving them food, cleaning them up, uh, cleaning wounds, uh, and uh, just this dynamo that no one could believe the work that she did. And she started a house of religious nuns in Calcutta, I want to say uh, in the, the late 1930s. And this spread throughout the world, her houses of, of what I call battalions of civilization in the poorest of the poor areas of the world. And people were astounded by how could this small, frail nun accomplish so much for the world's poor from a spiritual perspective. If you looked at her routine, she would spend an hour every morning in Eucharistic adoration and would often say that I spent an hour with the Lord and then I just saw the Lord and everyone else that I met that day. And she saw in the poor uh, the suffering of Jesus Christ. But what's interesting is she kept this up for 60 plus years. And when this work was published about 10 years ago, uh, people's jaws dropped. And people's jaws dropped because she experienced a, a dark night of the soul, uh, which she claims in her writings lasted about 60 years, where she had wonderful consolations of Jesus, and there came a point where through her prayer and experience of Jesus was told by him that this would be the last time she would experience his presence in this life. And this was shocking to read. Her spiritual director knew this, and her mentors knew this, but the wider public never knew this. And so I just quote a few passages from various things that she wrote uh, that are compiled in this book. Quote, do not think that my spiritual life is strewn with roses. That is the flower which I hardly ever find on my way. Quite the contrary, I have more often as my companion darkness. And when the night becomes very thick, and it seems to me as if I will end up in hell, then I simply offer myself to Jesus. If he wants me to go there, I am ready, but only under the condition that it really makes him happy. That was a letter to her confessor dated in 1937. She was on a retreat in the 50s, and she wrote many notes, but I just uh, grabbed this uh, line or two. Do I value the salvation of my soul? I don't believe I have a soul. There is nothing in me. And then later that year, to a mentor, in the darkness, Lord, my God, who am I that you should forsake me? There is no one to answer, no one on whom I can cling. No, no one, alone. The dark is so dark, and I am alone, unwanted, forsaken. Where is my faith? I have no faith. If there be God, please forgive me. And then toward the end of her life, if I ever become a saint, I will be one of darkness. I will continually be absent from heaven to light the light of those in darkness on earth. So this was a bit jarring to people who did not know uh, the inside story of Mother Teresa, someone who labored in darkness, tested like the Old Testament prophets or like St. Paul, but continued doing the will of God. So continuing our, our discussion then, and, and there are many other saints that I could point to uh, who would have similar expressions. And so the points I make here, our, our experience should not be the focus, but doing God's will. Don't seek a conversion experience, but a true conversion of your mind and heart to God who is goodness, truth, and love. 
This is not to reject human experience at all. That's not the point I'm making. And we experience God's will in our lives. I'm not uh, suggesting that does not happen either. But what I am saying is that always must put in the context of first do the will of God and your experiences will be what they will be, both consoling and at time dry. Seek first not a feeling of love and forgiveness, but turn toward God in true humility to see how he loves and forgives, and then go do the same. Balthazar, in another work called The Grain of Wheat, uh, describes it this way. It would, of course, be absurd to say that the notion of experience has no role to play in faith. It certainly does, in a sense of vocation, in detecting the movements of grace, and in reading the signs of the times. But still, all of that is secondary to the one thing necessary, which is God's will. Through prayer, we should come to perceive and savor God within us. And yet, in prayer, we should not be seeking enjoyment, but rather the pure service of God. In order for us to learn how to unite both things, our experience and God's will, God takes us to school which consists in a continual alteration of consolations and abandonments until we have learned how one can even enjoy in a wholly selfless manner. Now, I could could talk about other uh, saints. The ones that come to mind that are the classic masters are people like Thomas Akempis, uh, The Imitation of Christ, or St. Francis de Sales, uh, An Introduction to a Devout Life. In fact, St. Francis de Sales was canonized by the Catholic Church, and he was so beloved that the Anglicans also made him a saint. Uh, And this all occurred in the 16th and then 17th centuries. But what I'd like to move to, and, and these slides are not in your deck, but if you look at the lives of the saints in general, and these are simplifications, uh, but I always like to get to the headlines for you as fast as I can. Uh, But there are things that characterize the spiritual life that we've been talking about. Uh, There is a cycle. And if you're familiar with the the works of St. John of the Cross or St. Teresa of Avila, uh, the interior castle, or uh, the ascent of Mount Carmel of St. John of the Cross, there are the initial conversion or decision to enter a religious order or a monastery. And there's consolations that are associated with that. God gives us a little uh, tailwind spiritually. But all of these writers talk about the inevitable dryness in their prayer life, in their spiritual life that occurs. By dryness, we mean incredible distractions. We mean absence of God. I don't experience God in any way, shape, or form. Everything is dark. Uh, My fellow priests or nuns are rubbing me the wrong way constantly. This creates a detachment from these things. Why did you expect to be comfortable in the first place? St. Teresa of Lisieux talked about once when she was doing laundry with the other nuns and cleaning clothes for the convent, that the other nun was splashing dirty water in her face, unknowingly washing the clothes. She was about to turn to the nun and say, stop that. (laughs) And she realized, well, this is what happened to Jesus on the way to the cross when he fell three times. So I'm going to purify this and not say anything about it. And was continually splashed with dirty water. Now that little vignette, it's hard for me to understand. I would have thrown an elbow. Um, But you see what the saints do. They detach from the stuff that gets in the way of union with God. So this cycle continues of dryness, detachment, and then a deeper union with God, which creates another round and deeper round of consolations. And then this repeats throughout life. And... We have this in our own state of life. If you are uh, a married couple, you have the joys of the uh, engagement, uh, the the wedding day, 
uh, early days of, of marriage. And then you settle in as the years go on to the task of living together, actually. So this cycle occurs in the married state as well. The joys of married life give ways to maybe the, the nursery and the sounds of the nursery. <laughs> uh, priests experience this. Priests, when they say mass for the first time, do you think that's the same experience when they say mass 10 years in to their priesthood, 20 years in? How do you think a seminarian is on his first sick call in the hospital in an emergency ward versus a priest who's been a priest for 40 years visiting a hospital? There's this constant purification that goes on in every state of life where the attachments you had that made you take those first steps, God wants to deepen that. He wants to deepen your relationship with your spouse, with your vocation, with him. And so this is the school that God puts us in, this alternation of, alteration of consolation and dryness that creates this detachment that leads to a deeper union. Immature people want to cling to that initial experience and try to put a headlock on it forever. So whether that means going through three wives or 33 wives or spouses, what people are trying to recreate is that honeymoon period on a permanent basis. Or priests who want to be constantly uh, amazing and entertaining are trying to constantly create that uh, excitement that uh, characterized their initial priesthood. So this applies to every state of life, this cycle that the saints talk about and write about. But if you go more deeply into their writings, you see a pattern. First is the life of prayer, is foundational. If there's no prayer, there's no saint. And it's literally a one-to-one -one correlation. Another correlation is love of the Eucharist, love of Jesus present, body and blood, soul and divinity in the Eucharist, the Mass. You know, St. Francis de Sale actually advocated long before it was even uh, popular uh, monthly and daily and weekly communion for lay people. In fact, he wrote that work, An Introduction to a Devout Life, somewhere in the uh, early 1600s uh, for lay people to in increase their reception of Holy Communion in a time where people may be received once a year, maybe. And it would take the reforms of Pius X in the latter part of the 19th century, early part of the 20th century, to advocate for daily communion in the Catholic Church. And yet, St. Francis de Sale was advocating for that almost 300 years before. So love of the Mass, love of the Eucharist, and adoration before the Blessed Sacrament. Devotion to Mary is also prevalent in these great spiritual masters. The last thing which is often disturbing for us is a profound sense of sin, their own personal sin, and a profound sense of gratitude for what God has accomplished in Jesus Christ. And sometimes when you read what they write about themselves, it's off-putting. It almost feels like a self-loathing. But when you read more deeply into it, what you see is that the closer you get to the light of Christ, the more that light shines on you and pours out self-knowledge in abundance, you see more of your own imperfections. And these saints walk toward that light. And just as you hold a light up to a painting and you might see more of its imperfections or the brush strokes, uh, so too, when the saints approach the light of Christ, they have a, a real conscious sense of their own sinfulness on a scale that would make us uncomfortable. It would really, we almost sense that the implications are too great, and so we don't necessarily even want to be saints, because I would have to slay the self too much. It's a high price, too high a price to pay.
The saints pay that price. That's why we call them saints. And that's why they have the incredible uh, witness of their example and the wisdom of their writings. But we could point to this cycle uh, in our own state of life all the time. Could be even a new job that we get weary of. Everything human in this life, every finite thing that we thought was wonderful, will go through this cycle. And the key is to advance through it. Now, I have to give you more examples of this because, and this isn't in your deck either, but I, I'm sure most of you are familiar with uh, C.S. Lewis and the screw tape letters. And, and, and briefly, what that work is about, for those of you who are not familiar with it, is it's a wonderful piece of, of satire. And it's charting, it's a collection of letters from a senior devil tempter named Uncle Screwtape who's giving coaching advice to his protege, Wormwood, who has been assigned a human being to tempt and to get into hell. And so he's giving negative advice on how to coax the human person away from God and toward Satan, toward the devil. And so throughout the letters, he's giving coaching instructions. And what's interesting and creative by C.S. Lewis is He'll refer to the person, the soul, as the patient. And he'll refer to Jesus as the enemy because everything's reversed in the book. And I just want to read uh, two sections briefly, so don't worry, uh, of advice from the devil's perspective. So Uncle Screwtape is now giving some coaching instructions to Wormwood. And the subject is prayer. The best thing, Wormwood, where it is possible, is to keep the patient from the serious intention of praying altogether. When the patient is an adult recently reconverted to the enemy's party, to Christianity, like your man, this is best done by encouraging him to remember or to think he remembers the parrot-like nature of his prayers in childhood. In reaction against that, he may be persuaded to aim at something entirely spontaneous, inward, informal, and unregularized. And what this will actually mean to a beginner will be an effort to produce in himself a vaguely devotional mood in which real concentration of will and mind have no part. One of their poets, Coleridge, I think, has recorded that he did not pray with moving lips and bended knees, but merely composed his spirit to love and indulged a sense of supplication. Now, Wormwood, that is exactly the sort of prayer we want. And since it bears a superficial resemblance to the prayer of silence as practiced by those who are very far advanced in the enemy's service, clever and lazy, lazy patients can be taken in for it for quite a long time. At the very least, they can be persuaded that the bodily position makes no difference to their prayers. For they constantly forget what you must always remember that they are animals and that whatever their bodies do affects their souls. It is funny how mortals always picture us as putting things into their minds. In reality, our best work is done by keeping things out. If this fails, you must fall back on a subtler misdirection of his intention. Whenever they are tending to the enemy himself, we are defeated. But there's always ways of preventing them from doing so. The simplest is to turn their gaze away from him toward themselves. Keep them watching their own minds and trying to produce feelings there by the action of their own wills. When they meant to ask him for love, let them instead try to start manufacturing loving feelings for themselves and not notice that this is what they are doing. When they meant to pray for courage, let them really be trying to feel brave. When they say they are praying for forgiveness, let them be trying to feel forgiven. Teach them to estimate the value of each prayer by their success in producing the desired feeling. And never let them suspect how much success or failure of that kind depends on whether they are well or ill, fresh or tired at that moment. So what C.S. Lewis is talking about in another section is the law, the spiritual law of undulation. So undulation isn't just about 
how do I read a golf green and get the break right on the putt? But it is that cycle I was talking about earlier of dryness, consolation, advance, joys, darkness, fear, absence. This is the school that God puts us in for our own good. He gives us wonderful things he withdraws just to see do we want him or do we want what's in his hand. So Lewis continuing this in another letter. So Uncle Screwtape, the senior devil, writes another letter to uh, Wormwood, his nephew, because the patient, they're struggling to keep control over him. He's starting to go to more prayer groups. He's starting to go to church more. So they're, they're panicking. So he's talking about, let's try to use this spiritual law of back and forth, undulation. And here's what he says. And this is where the troughs come in, the, the dark parts. You must have often wondered why the enemy does not make more use of his own power to be sensibly present to human souls in any degree. He chooses, and at any moment. But you see now that the irresistible and the indisputable are the two weapons which the very nature of his scheme forbids him to use. Merely to override a human will, as his felt presence in any but the faintest and most mitigated degree would certainly do, would be for him useless. He cannot ravish. He can only woo. For his ignoble idea is to eat the cake and have it. The creatures are to be one with him, but yet themselves. Merely to cancel them or assimilate them will not serve him. He is prepared to do a little overriding at the beginning. He will set them off with communications of his presence, which, though faint, seem great to them, with emotional sweetness and easy conquest over their initial temptations. But he never allows this state of affairs to last long. Sooner or later, he withdraws, if not in fact, at least from their conscious experience all those supports and incentives. He leaves the creature to stand up on its own legs, to carry out from the will alone duties which have all lost their relish. It is during such trough periods, much more than during peak periods, that it is growing into the sort of creature he wants it to be. Hence the prayers offered in the state of dry, dryness are those which please him best. We can drag our patience along continually by tempting because we designed them for our table in hell. And the more their will is interfered with, the better for us. He cannot tempt to virtue the way we tempt to vice. He wants them to learn to walk and must therefore take away his hand. And if only the will to walk is really there, he is even pleased with their stumbles. Do not be deceived, Wormwood. Our cause is never more in danger than when a human no longer desiring but still intending to do our enemy's will looks around upon a universe from which every trace of him seems to be lost and vanished and asks why he has been forsaken and still obeys. Very interesting uh, uh, advice to the junior devil talking about this law of undulation in the spiritual life of the peaks and the troughs that God uses to purify our will, to strengthen our will. So I just wanted to give you, you know, some concrete examples of this uh, law of undulation. And uh, we should be back into the, the deck. At least I hope we are. <laughs> okay. So we can say with St. Paul and Mother Teresa, St. Mother Teresa of Calcutta, the spiritual life is a life of little things done with great love. And it is a hidden life that Paul talks about, but not in the sense of invisible, but preoccupied with the one thing necessary, doing the will of God, the higher things. And as we read in Paul's letter to the Colossians, if then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hid with Christ in God. So this mystery of God's hiddenness in our life, that he's not tangibly present the way we'd like him to be, 
and that our human experience is subject to testing and is not just the norm by which we act, is hard and difficult for us to grasp. We want our experience to be validated. We want our way. And God actually has higher plans for us and actually wants what's good for us more than we want what's good for us. You know, St. John of the Cross wrote that the human mind is the greatest idol-making machine in the universe. And he, he wrote that during his work on the dark night of the soul. That often the human contribution to our spiritual life is the idols we create. And we associate God's action with that mental construct. So the, the point of tonight was to suggest that the saints in this presentation of the spiritual life as this law of undulations holds the key to building a spiritual life and union with God on a deeper and deeper and deeper level throughout our life. We are never done. Uh, in a class or two before, uh, the focus on compliance with rules, of course, is important. But it's all on account of this union we ought to be seeking with God. I'll close with a quotation from Pascal, and we'll leave the G.K. Chesterton quote for another time. Uh, but I've always thought this was an interesting quotation from Pascal. God wanted to be hidden. If there were only one religion, God would be clearly manifested. If there were martyrs and only one religion, the same. God being therefore hidden, any religion which does not say God is hidden is not true. And any religion which does not give the reason why does not enlighten. Ours does all this. Truly thou art a hidden God. Isaiah 45, 15. So I, I covered a lot of ground there without making time for questions, but I wanted to give a, a classical perspective on the spiritual life. Uh, and I didn't talk about particular devotions. I didn't talk about the sacraments. I didn't talk about how to uh, be present at Mass because there is something that undergrounds all of that. And what that is is that cycle of that spiritual law of consolation, detachment, dryness, deeper union, which repeats all throughout our lives. And the key is to, as the saying says, Life is like a bridge. Pass over it, but don't build on it. <laughs> and our spiritual life should have this kind of, of uncertainty in the sense of we have one foot in eternity already and one foot here on earth. We shouldn't get too comfortable with our spiritual life because of this open-ended nature of this cycle that all the saints talk about when they write about this. So with that, our, uh, we have time for comments and or questions. So the question is, in, in the writings that we were looking at of uh, St. Mother Teresa of Calcutta, where she's talking about this deep darkness that she experienced, or other saints who write in ways about themselves that are very shocking, how negative they are about themselves. Could this be cases of, of depression of some kind, of, of some kind of psychological condition uh, and so on. And, I, and the way I would respond to that in the case of Mother Teresa is she actually cited this in the late 1930s as something Jesus said was going to happen to her. Uh, and so to, to, in her case, to accept what you're saying means she made that up to expl I'm sorry? Yes, yes. So uh, when the saints talk about this, they, they talk about it in, uh, in ways that... Uh, that wouldn't be your first conclusion necessarily, though we would be astonished at, at what they write about. Um, so could there be psychological conditions at work? Certainly there could be. Uh, and, uh, but in St. Teresa of Calcutta, uh, she wrote about it in the 1930s as something that Jesus said was going to happen to her. St. Paul speaks of a thorn in his side that the good Lord gave him. So it's unclear that it's just reducible to that, and it's more likely it's what they said it was. Right, yeah, that question. was what was so shocking about the book that was published is 
This was going on in the inside, and yet she was this pleasant, joyful, happy, incredibly productive person. Yes? Right. And often these saints are under obedience writing these things down because their superiors have said, we want you to keep a diary, we want you to keep a journal, because they knew this would be valuable for others uh, one day. So, yes, question back there. Sure. So the, the, the question was, we, we just spent some time on Luther last week, uh, who had also this magnified sense of his own unworthiness and wretchedness and sin, and yet he went this different direction, whereas saints, contemporaries of his even, because um, St. Teresa of Avila was a 16th century uh, saint, you know, went in a different direction. And I think that what that gets down to is that God's love <coughs> is greater than our sin. And psychologically or however spiritually that was understood by Catholic saints, they understood that God's love is so much greater and plentiful than anything I can do to uh, put obstacles to that through my sins. Whereas for Luther, you could argue there was something psychological there, uh, frankly. And I'm not just saying that because he's a Lutheran. <laughs> but if you read his writings, and I gave you, as I mentioned to someone, uh, I gave you the PG-13 version of his writings. The anti-Semitism, the horrific statements against his opponents, the fomenting of the peasants' war, and then the direction to the princes to slaughter the peasants wouldn't come from the pen of Mother Teresa of Calcutta or St. John of the Cross. So we were dealing with a highly unstable human being in Martin Luther. Yes? Well, certainly they were given... Were the saints given more than us muckety-mucks? <laughs> But, but keep in mind, the saints we read about are the ones the church has chosen to beatify and canonize. But there's probably the vast majority of saints that we'll never know about who are leading a day-to-day -day life, and many are probably in this room, uh, who are never going to be canonized. They'll never have a, a holy card in their name, but they quietly uh, did what they were called to do. And, but you're right. Abundant graces are given to extraordinary lives. I think we would all agree that the apostles or the missionaries throughout the world are given uh, incredible graces to carry on the way they do uh, in, in ways that are truly extraordinary. All right, everyone, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right. you mentioned Thomas Mann. Yeah. Which one of his books